Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. You know, everybody, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and we know you'd rather we get right to talk about beekeeping. However, our great sponsors are critical to making all of this happen. From the transcripts, the hosting fees, the software, the hardware, microphones, recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. We want to thank Two Million Blossoms, the sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Listen to Two Million Blossoms, the podcast at www.twomillionblossoms.com. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're really, really happy you're here. Hey, Kim, are you dug out from all that snow yet? (laughs) <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready for that, buddy. <laughs> it's been it's been winter here, and it doesn't look like it's going to stop. But the, that darn ground, groundhog, you mm-hmm. know, came up and screwed everything up. Well, you saw that email from Hannah the Hornet from the Washington State Department, State Department of Agriculture, didn't you? Yes, I did. <laughs> Hannah the Hornet, the Hannah the Asian Giant Hornet uh, yep. newsletter. Six more weeks. Six more weeks. Uh, wow. But I was able to get out to my bees uh, last weekend. Uh, we had a spot of um, a, a warmer-ish weather. And anyways, I was able to count up the dead outs and I cleaned out a couple of them. That's always such a nasty, dirty job. It is. Yep. I don't, I don't enjoy that at all. You know, Jim, too, Jim, too, and I were talking about that on uh, Honey Bee Obscura. And uh, one of the questions that came up was about uh, those, those colonies that lived about, should they be requeened? You know, um, there's a lot to think about there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. It was important to me to get them cleaned out before they got nasty, and and uh, at least the springtime they'll be a little bit easier to put bees in the ones that I was wanted to bring in, and also take out the really black comb and without yeah. uh, fighting bees for it. So uh, it's a, not a happy job, but uh, one that all beekeepers have to do at some point. There's no doubt, and uh, I have yet to look forward to that. <laughs> I can't to... see my colonies from here. They're <laughs> under 18 inches of snow. Get the snowblower out just to get to them, <laughs> huh? All right. So, Kim, we've had some changes or some additions to the podcast. and will just bring them to uh, our listeners' attention. First of all, is last week we introduced um, the brand new feature that you do with our new sponsor, Northern Bee Books, Bee Books, old new. Yes, we've, we've uh, started working with uh, Jeremy Burbage there. And uh, what we're looking at is Bee Books, old and new, reviewing reviewing new Bee Books, some that he's published, some that others have published that are brand new, and then taking a look at some of the classics. Uh, we did one on Pelt with by Pellet, the history of American beekeeping, and, and looking at C.C. C. Miller and some of the some of the some of the classic beekeeping writers. And if you can find those books, uh, <clears throat> and they're 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 still around, if you can find those books, um, like I said, they're classics, and and you should get one, and then enjoy it, and then share it. Uh, that is a hobby. I won't say it's a hobby, but that's one of the things I like to do. Uh, going past uh, old old bookstore or secondhand bookstore is go find the B book section and see if I can find a early edition or first edition of 
of any bee book, and especially something from the early 1900s. That's fun. I think used bookstores are more rare than used books anymore. <laughs> the used Amazon store? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And and second, we we've enabled a new feature on our podcast on Beekeeping Today podcast, and also on our um, uh, on our other podcast, the Honey Bee Obscura, the blog page. Just started one. Um, uh, it's been up for just a little bit yet. It's across the top of the page. You'll see the blog link, and that'll take you there. And we're talking about some of the things on climate change, and and. Uh, uh, Jim has got one on a honeybee obscure, and he's looking at uh, observation hives. I think wasn't it? Yes, his is on um, building an observation hive. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. A small observation hive. So take a look at those, and uh, when you're fishing around the webpage looking for something new. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm going to write something for the blog about my winter cleanouts or the dead outs, the cleaning up of the dead outs, and with some pictures. Uh, so. That's more self therapy than it is anything else, but <laughs> maybe maybe um, a, a listener too can yeah share the grief. Huh? Yeah, misery <laughs> loves company. <laughs> All right, hey, I'm looking forward to today's show to having Randy Oliver on the Beekeeping Today podcast for a long time, and we finally been able to mesh up schedules and make it happen. You you've known Randy for quite a while, haven't you? Uh, just I think the whole time I've been here. Yeah. I've been to his place a couple of times and uh, visited with him, been to a lot of meetings with him. And if you've heard Randy talk, you know what to expect. If you hasn't, if you haven't, get a, get a seat belt because uh, it's a ride and a half. <laughs> so if, if you're needing coffee, pause the <laughs> podcast right now, go get your coffee, come back and start it up again because you'll need to have your ears up to speed to catch everything Randy has to say. In yep. fact, this is going to be a good a good time to review the transcripts of the show. Yes, good, good idea. All right, well, let's get right to the interview with Randy Oliver of Scientific Beekeeping. But first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees digestion and improve your honeybees response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Hey, and while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of product information and beekeeping facts. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is Randy Oliver. Randy Oliver, finally, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Good to see you again, Randy. You too, Kim. Hey, Randy, before we get going, because there's so much to cover, but I just, for our for our listeners, can you just give us a little brief bio of who you are and your background in beekeeping? Sure. I've always been a naturalist since I was a, a young child. I grew up um, just out in the uh, in the marshes and the streams, and then uh, in high school, a uh, colony a swarm of bees landed in a neighbor's yard. I hived it, not knowing at all what I was doing, and then uh, needed to learn something. And found out that one of the uh, my classmates' fathers was a sideline beekeeper with a couple hundred colonies, and he could use a strong back. So I <laughs> learned uh, beekeeping traditional way by apprenticing to somebody making their living at keeping bees. Um, I went on then to get degrees in uh, uh, entomology and um, uh, running an um, um, insectary, setting my insectary at the University of California, and then um, uh, then moved up to the Northern California, took my bees with me, uh, ran a farm store for a while, and then decided to go back to um, uh, uh, grad school, got a degree in uh, fish culture, fisheries, uh, fish culture, fisheries biology. Then went to uh, 
uh, get a PhD at um, UC Davis. But prior to, uh, to applying, I got interviewed and I found out that there were no jobs out there for anybody with a PhD in apiculture at that time. And I had a family by that time. So um, I said, okay. And I went in and uh, I had put myself through college uh, doing construction, building houses. And so I uh, continued contracting and built my bee business at the same time until it was large enough. It hit 400 hives running by myself. And that was enough for me to quit construction and um, doing okay until Varroa arrived. <laughs> and then when Varroa arrived and I lost virtually every single colony and just was devastated. And I said, you know what? I got, I got, you know, degrees in, in uh, entomology. Um, why am I letting some damn parasite kick my butt? And I decided, well, I'm going to go back, start hitting hit the books and self-educated, read the literature and, and then start sharing what I knew with other beekeepers and found out that there, there was a big hole as far as um, extension services. There were a few, you know, like Eric Mustin was out there and a few other good extension agents, but not like we had, they had in other agriculture, and um, somebody who could who could translate the science into practical application for the beekeepers. And I found that there was just a, I, I, I stepped into this hole and just slid right and got sucked in by this. Of, <laughs> of it was um, a niche I, I didn't realize it was there, but boy, as soon as I stepped into it, they just swallowed me up. Beekeepers were hungry for extension people who could explain the science behind beekeeping and so scientific beekeeping has nothing to do with test tubes or or that kind of stuff it has to do with uh, doing practical applied beekeeping but doing it based upon instead of doing basing it upon old wives tales and what your uncle did do it for actually based upon the biology and chemistry and physics of what's actually happening in the hive and understanding that very good and that brings us up today and and you said you're you're based there in uh, Northern California. Yeah. So you're right in the middle of all the almond fields. Well, no, we're actually up in the mountains, um, okay. about 3000 foot elevation. We, we would, uh, if we could see them, we could look down over the almond orchards, which are down in the bottom of the valley. So actually our bloom starts up here before it does at the valley floor because the cold air settles down in the valley. Now, <laughs> but, but it's not as cold. That, so it, doesn't it doesn't we don't get snow down there don't get normally get hard freezes where we get snow we just so the snow just melted up here we and we do get hard uh, freezes up here but interestingly um because that cool air pulling down there the almond trees uh actually uh start blooming up here before they do down there although they can't they don't rarely set nuts up here because we get uh then killing our frosts that kill the nutlets that they don't get down in the valley so uh so anyways we're the problem we have right now is our alder trees have already started blooming. So, um, uh, and that's typical in the second week of January, the alders start blooming. The bees start gathering that pollen like crazy. We have another shrub here that starts to put out a little bit of ne nectar. Normally not this early, but it's starting to bloom now. So our colonies are actually on a nectar and pollen flow uh, yeah. right now. It's just warm enough for them to forage. It's up, up in the, uh, uh, you know, hitting the 60s during the day. And uh, they're building like crazy and brooding up. And we got to load them on trucks because of the chill factor. The almond growers are suspecting it's going to be an early bloom. The tree's got enough chill factor and it's warm weather down there. So the growers are freaking out, making sure the beekeepers actually can fill their contracts and get the bees sitting on the grounds in the orchards, which means we're picking colonies up that are in build up mode on a nectar and pollen flow and moving them down to where there is zero forage mm. whatsoever into a desert. And it's going to be that way until the trees actually start blooming around the second week of February. So because of this, the logistics of having to move a lot of loads and the, and satisfying the growers, the guarantee they want to actually see the hive sitting there, we'll pull them off of the nectar and pollen flow, move them down there, and then put pollen sub patties into all the hives and maybe sugar syrup just to continue the buildup while they're sitting there in the desert until the trees start blooming. Wow. Does it look like there's going to be enough bees uh, this year for all, for the almonds? You got a feel for that? Oh, every everybody asks that question every single year at this time. And anybody <laughs> who answers that question is talking out of their behind. <laughs> because there, right now, there's a lot of, there's, we only, in California, there's only in the forage during the rest of the year. 
for about a quarter of the number of hives that are necessary for almond pollination. So that means about three quarters of the, of the hives necessary for pollination come in from out of state, many of them from up in the Dakotas. So like I have uh, one friend right now, who just texted me and said, oh my God, I can't, my H2A workers who normally help drive the trucks to semis to take my hives out of the cold storage uh, uh, barns that he has in the Dakotas to California, they couldn't do it. So he only has him and his sons and their wives and girlfriends that okay. could possibly drive trucks. And they have 40 semi loads oh my of gosh. hives in North Dakota, 20 days to get them into California and only a crew of total of seven to do it. And they're just freaking out. So it sounds like there may be enough bees somewhere. There but... may be that. So the question is with yeah. the trucking shortage and all that, getting them in and, and it, what happens with this time, uh, Kim, um, everybody at the national conventions, uh, usually um, early January, ha- asks the same question. But most, many of the bees are still in cold storage or haven't really been checked by the beekeepers uh, yet. So it's just a wild guess. And you hear horror stories. Oh, yeah, we had so-and-so had 30% losses. So-and-so had 40 or 70% losses. You hear that every year. And then you get to go, oh, my gosh. And then as it starts to get here to the end of January, you start getting more of a reality check. And you can tell that by how many bee brokers are phoning you saying, hey, you got any extra hives? <laughs> <laughs> or you have beekeepers saying, hey, you know, I got a few extra hives. You got no if anything. So there's a lot of talk, you know, cell phones and email going around. And we kind of get a feeling right now. So I, I'm not hearing total de- desperation. I'm not hearing about a, a glut otherwise. Now, and there will always be some beekeepers. See, most of us try to run, hold back maybe 10% of our hives to cover our bases. And one of the things about that, that last 10%, if there is a shortage at the end, it's an inelastic demand, which means the, um, the growers, almond growers, to get crop insurance, they need to have evidence that they placed, that they ran a two hives per acre. Right. To pollinate right. The crop. If they don't have two hives per acre, paperwork showing that they rented that and the crop fails due to weather or something they cannot collect their insurance so this makes it an inelastic demand they are going to want to they're going to have to rent beehives so towards the end if there's a shortage they start bidding against each other and the price yeah. goes up so those beekeepers who still have their 10 percent that they weren't going to bring out maybe they were too weak maybe they're actually a whole bunch of close to dead outs you know with one frame of bees because nobody inspects those crop insurance hives. So if there's even any bees flying in or out the entrance, those growers will pay through the nose to get them there. And so there are beekeepers who gamble on holding out to the end and trying to get that premium price. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to get to your, I want to, I want to get, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to get to your Varroa uh, work here in a minute, but I got one more almond yeah. question, and 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 of course that has to do with uh, the self fertile almonds that are coming up. And do you see a future for lots and lots and lots of those? I know the ones that they came up with a few years ago were self fertile, and they'd set a crop, but they'd set a better crop with bees. But I'm yeah. hearing now that there's a new one out there that doesn't need bees really at all. Is, is am I am uh, I close that, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been recent research since then, and it doesn't need bees, but you make you make a better crop. And when I've done the math, the addition of, of what the grower would make by having bees in there more than pays for the cost of pollination. Well, that makes sense then that they're going to keep so, bees going. Actually, and as a beekeeper, I'll tell you right now, you know, we're all stretched to the max uh, trying to supply enough bees for the almond orchards because we're running out of forage in the rest of the United States for, for that. Like we ran out of forage in California a long time ago, especially with our droughts. You know, if we can't supply enough bees to take the pressure off a bit would be nice. And and people say, well, beekeepers set the price for almond pollination. Well, that's absolutely untrue. The growers set the price. We beekeepers are totally at the mercy of the growers. It's the growers bidding against each other for the supply. It's a supply and demand bidding. The price <laughs> yeah. is set by what <laughs> price makes it worthwhile for a beekeeper to put, dump the money into those hives to supply those extra hives, okay? The marginal cost of investment to, to if a grower says, well, you know, I need I need a thousand hives this year, but I got another uh, uh, orchard coming into bloom, I'm gonna need an extra thousand hives. Well, the beekeeper has to say, well, it's gonna cost me a lot of money to 
produce a, a thousand hives and then keep them alive for a year and then feed them prior to pollination to build them up and then truck them down there. Uh, you know, I can't do it for less than, you know, $250 or $200. And that's, that's reality a price of what it would take to even make it worthwhile increasing your number of hives. Otherwise you're going to be losing money to, to yeah. service the growers. So, so what it is, it's supply and demand of what the, what the almond growers are willing to um, produce. And, if they didn't keep planting more and more acres of trees every year, the price would be a a lower a lower price because it'd be easier to supply the bees. But they keep planting them. There's a good demand for almonds still, and um, we're we're in an interesting situation because the groundwater is running out in uh, yeah. uh, certain areas in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, and a lot of orchards are going to come out of the ground and maybe move to Northern California, maybe move to Idaho. They're looking for other places that they can grow almond trees where there's more water. So climate change is really hitting California hard, very, very hard. And it's a whole different world. There's no more normal here at, at all. And that's going to affect the almond growers. Better Bee is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. Well, you just mentioned <coughs> keeping those bees alive uh, between essentially between almond crops, and, and and the biggest part of that is dealing with varroa. And I know you've done a lot of work on that. What what are you doing with varroa? The, your varroa program now. Where are you headed? Do you think? Okay. Well, it's it's really uh, two things, Kim. It's it's nutrition and varroa. So nutrition is the bottom line, and then varroa is well, uh, if, if the bees get good nutrition, that also means good nutrition for varroa, <laughs> because varroa cannot grow unless the bees are rearing brood. So with, if the colonies get a good nutrition and, and growing large enough um, to grow to almonds, that means it's also growing varroa mites. And this is the, the, the big problem is, is maintaining uh, uh, the, the, or dealing with the mites. So what happened is it, when we first got varroa, and it's really not varroa that's the problem. The problem is are the viruses, mainly deforming virus. Varroa is the vector of the virus. So controlling varroa is really like trying to control malaria by controlling the vector. If you can keep the mosquito population down, then malaria is not a problem. But if you don't control the mosquitoes, the vector, then they transmit malaria. And varroa controls the same thing. What you're doing, you're controlling the vector of the, of the disease that actually takes the bees down, which is viruses. So the, um, starting, starting off, uh, the first few years we had varroa, you could get a sky-high population of mites in your colony and it's harmful for the colony, but it doesn't kill the colony. And once a year, you can put in a, a synthetic miticide treatment, kill all the mites in, in fall, and just cover the bottom board with a layer of mites, and the bees would survive and, and take off again next year. So once a year, you could do a, a, a treatment that way. Unfortunately, that kind of strong selective pressure means that you're, you're doing directed evolution for the mites to evolve resistance to that specific pesticide. And this is synthetic pesticides or miticides have very specific targets, usually in the sodium gated ion channels or something like that in the um, mice nervous system. So it's, it's a very small change in, uh, in genetics in order to get resistance. And there's often not a very big cost to the mite to develop resistance. So the first uh, major miticide, levalinate, and in six years we started seeing um, my populations that were completely resistant. Um, the second thing was, is that resi those resistant populations were not as vigorous mites at reproducing. So it actually made varroa control fairly easy because the, the mites didn't grow uh, very well. But then when resistance got enough, we needed a new chemical. And they came out with uh, kumaphos. They actually <laughs> registered a, an organophosphate, which had been trying to phase out and said, oh, you can put it right into your beehives. <laughs> Put an organophosphate. What beekeeper would have ever thought we'd be putting an organophosphate into our hives? Well, we did. Well, it was even easier for the mice to develop resistance to the uh, to the kumaphos. In three years, it completely, absolutely failed 
ev- everywhere. <laughs> there was one other on my side left, and that was Ambitress. And that um, that was first showing how to you be used by researchers by using an off-the-shelf product called Tactic. It was a, a cattle tick dip. And um, and they showed it, you could you know, mix it with vegetable oil, put it on a stick or a towel or something, throw it in your hive, and it controlled controlled um bro uh, well the problem was it wasn't registered for that use so um but nonetheless commercial beekeepers pretty quick i'll shift it over to most of them all using uh tactic amitraz for mite management <clears throat> and it worked for quite a few years and finally the epa is is tough because all we beekeepers if we complain about pesticide misuse by the growers <laughs> well the epa says well how about you guys talk about being pesticide scoff laws the whole damn industry is using illegal miticides. And so um, then um, uh, Toyo, um, oh, I can't remember his last, last name. Um, he approached me a number of years ago and said, hey, Randy, we, we manufacture Amitraz. We'd like to, is it, would it be worthwhile for us to put it in a formulated product in a strip and, and, and sell it to the U.S.? And the, and the problem was that the EPA has what's called a risk cut of how much of any pesticide they'll allow the human population to be exposed to. And with Amitraz, the, the risk cup was pretty full because it was now being used for flea and tick collars for dogs and cats, which means you know, the housewife, if they pet their, their, their dog or their cat with a, with a tick collar on, they're going to be exposed to a certain amount of Amitraz. So that raises the risk cup. So EPA said, well, if you want to come out with a miticide in a strip to put into the beehives, you're going to have to take another one off the market. And so the trade-off was he had to take Tactic, the cattle dip, off the market in order to be allowed to make the beekeeping product. And he told me about it a year ahead of time that that was going to happen. And he said, but you can't tell anybody, Randy, <laughs> because that's that's a, a secret uh, right now. They're not allowed to share that information. So for a year, I, I knew in advance that Tactic was going to be removed from the U.S. Uh, market. and then. It came about, it was removed. And, and what happened then now is the Chinese um, have taken advantage of that and beekeepers just go online and order it from shipped illegally from China and, and apply it. So this has been a, a big issue, especially with, with the state enforcement agents the, and the apiary inspectors. So they have to keep turning a blind eye to this illegal use of, of uh, uh, Amitraz by the commercial beekeepers. Now, on top of that, the mites are starting to finally show resistance. And this has been 20 some years. It's been amazing. There's apparently a very high cost to the mites to be resistant because otherwise that strain of mice, that bloodline would have completely outcompeted all the other mites in the commercial operations. So when it used to take maybe one treatment a year with Amitraz, now many beekeepers, they're, they're putting on five to 10 treatments a year to obtain the same degree of mite control with that with that product so the whole industry is kind of shaking in its boots right now saying hey what what's going to come after um amitraz after it starts to fail for me after uh seeing kumafos fail um in 2001 i said that's it i'm getting off of this treadmill <laughs> no more synthetic miticides and i said i'm going to see if we can keep bees alive using nothing but um the natural treatments which happen to be also organically approved and then they are time all from the time plant or it's synthetic but it comes from the time plant um formic acid uh, which is the smell of of ants that they put out and then oxalic acid which is what makes um spinach and uh and chard uh, taste uh, astringent in your mouth so it's part of the human diet it's also naturally a part of in in the honey those three products um it was a learning curve uh, starting in 2001 to try to keep our colonies alive and healthy using nothing but those natural products. But we were able to do it. And not, you're not successful immediately. It's a lot, lot to learn. But by this time now, we've been done it since the year 2001. So we're 20 years now without having ever used a synthetic miticide in our operation. The commercial beekeepers are starting to pay attention to that because they, they're, the easy skate with amateurs, they know it's not going to last much longer as the mice develop more and more resistance um, to this. So there's a uh, so there's two things that end result, Kim, that's going to solve the problem is having uh, mite resistant honeybee stocks that you can buy 
cells, um, these that exhibit strong mite resistance. So six or so years ago, I started, I said, I will walk the walk for you commercial queen producers and see if I can, by doing a, an inexpensive selective breeding program, and I, I kept track of the hours per year of what it costs. So I, have ex- exact, I can tell them exactly how many dollars is going to cost them to do this, to dedicate a thousand hives or, or so to a selective breeding program. And then I said, I'll walk the walk and see what kind of success we'll, we'll get. And we started off, and we're running about 1,500 hives in this breeding program each year, replacing all the queens every year, only from selected breeders, typically around 25 out of, out of 1,500 every year. So very strong uh, gen- genetic selection of that, bottlenecking of the genome. We started out with, with a fraction of 1% of our colonies exhibiting mite resistance. And we test this by doing mite washes uh, in late June, and any colony in which the mite population is increasing, we take out of the program and we, we treat them and uh, get the mites down. But if they still have mite counts of zero or, or only one mite, and our, our, we, we get concerned at a mite count of about six or higher. So if they can keep it down to one, zero, like the one to two mite level, then we put a, a tag on them and say, don't treat this high. When you say a, a mite count of one to three or one to six, you're saying per 300 bees yeah per a half per a half okay. cup of bees yeah and we and we standardize this we take it from this uh, the same type of frame out of every hive so a frame not from the brood nest itself but from a frame adjacent to the brood nest and by because your mite uh infestation rate varies for, on the bees from frame to frame so you can't just go <laughs> take any frame out of a hive you want to standardize that we have a very standardized method and what changed everything is I developed and built mechanical agitators. And I'm, I'm hoping to be able to just publish some plans for generation four right now. I'm just, we're out testing generation four this, this week. I've got thousands of hours into going through prototype after prototype after prototype, detailing how to make what an expensive with. And we have these cute little agitators now that we I have a bunch of them now um, that are uh, battery powered rechargeable they, and they'll recharge right off your uh, cigarette lighter in your in your car and um, uh, ha- handle the top and you pick them up and and you push a button and it does the entire agitation uh, 300 revolutions and it shuts itself off and you're ready to do it so we can now do these mite washes incredibly fast we uh, me and uh, two of my crew we did um, uh, 55 mite washes in 45 minutes um, on, on a yard. So we can realistically, and, and we do. So we we do a mite wash on all fifteen hundred hives in a few days, um, every every late June, and that's how we start our breeding program every year. So we started all of our nukes in the springtime. We give them a dribble with oxalic acid to reduce the mites, and then we let the mites grow. It's the, I call it the varroa race, and we're seeing which hives keep the varroa from getting ahead. They get they get a tag on them. We write down the date and the mite count. A month later. We come back and check them again. If the mites count has gone up, we pull the tag off and we give them a treatment and they, they stay in this, everybody stays in the same yard. After several of those, we have, we have colonies by the end of the year that the, our best ones are zero, 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 zero. Mites absolutely cannot grow in those colonies. And they are often the most productive colony in the yard for honey production. As gentle as pussycats, there's, we don't see any correlation between uh, defensiveness um, and mite resistance, and and no correlation with having to give up on honey producing production and uh, mite resistance. The problem is herita- lack of heritability. So, like I said, the first year we had a, a fraction of one percent of our colonies that passed the test. Then we went up to you know we got maybe two percent, three percent, seven percent. Uh, the last two years, we, we pushed maybe 8 to 10%. And right now, this year, it's looking like we're hitting the 17%. So we're, I get goosebumps saying that because that's, it's like this is the, maybe a breakthrough. The other really important thing is I've been looking, you do what's called progeny testing. That if the queen, that I'm, a, what I'm seeing is a colony I, I'm hypothesizing can exhibit complete resistance if only one or two of the patched lines of sisters in that colony have, exhibit a certain behavioral trait. Okay, so when a queen mates with, say, 25 drones, that means there's 25 families of half-sisters in that, in that colony. 
if even one of those families has the behavior of sniffing for a pupa that is infested by a mite and then uncapping that pupa, that may be all that has to be added there. The other bees will take over from there. So what apparently was happening is our resistant colonies may have just been picking up that genetics from a drone the queen made it with rather than the queen herself. So then grafting off that queen doesn't do any good. So all these years, we'll, we'll find these queens of colonies that are completely, absolutely resistant. They, they'll go two years without ever letting the mite population build up. But their daughters of those queens, because they mate with different drones, may not exhibit mm -hmm. that. We're finally starting to look like we're getting traction. And the big thing is this year, we had two yards where 50% of the colonies exhibited resistance. Um, one yard, when I was, uh, uh, the last few days, is just amazed me. That, mean, that is an indication that possibly we finally locked it, fixed it into the female, a female bloodline. So those colonies, I, I went out, I got these metal tags painted them fluorescent green and stapled them on the tops and landing boards of all the hives, the resistant hives in that yard, because my sons need to take them to almonds because they need to make the money down there. To me, they're very, I, I kept a few uh, of the most, the best ones <laughs> not to go just, just in case. Okay. But the rest are going, but I said, boys, I want all these green tag, the fluorescent green tag ones coming back. We're going to put them in one mating yard and then we're going to graft daughters off of them, make the nukes from the workers of those hives and the drones of those hives and made them out right there. And we're going to see if this is our breakthrough year of fixing mite resistance into the um, a bloodline. So progress has been slow, but in answer to Kim's question, that's the end result. Now, the second answer to Kim's question is what do we do in the meantime? Before exactly. we can say we, yeah. we can sell mite resistant queens. Because right now we don't, I don't make any claim for mite resistance at all. We, we sell lots of queens and nukes every year and people love them. But I, I'm not saying that, that they're going to be resistant, although a lot, a lot of them uh, are. So what do we do in the meantime? So there's, the problem is there's not a whole lot of good promising miticides out there that anybody is going to be willing to bring to market. What the beekeepers have trained the manufacturers is that if they take a, a miticide that is used commercially on other crops, and that manufacturer spends a whole lot of money to develop, register it for use in beehives, the beekeepers are going to ignore that. They're going to buy the cheap product off the shelf and make their own treatment. So we've trained the manufacturers, beekeepers are going to screw you if you spend the money to develop that product. So that means that we're stuck with having to either come up with something, a miticide that is not used and registered for any other application, and then that somebody can make a profit doing that, or we shift to the natural treatments, the, the biologicals, they're called the same ones that I'm using, the thymol, the formic acid, and the oxalic acid. And we use all three of those in rotation in our operation. The problem is we have a fairly short honey flow in California here. So by July, our honey flow is usually pretty much over, which means we can hop on drone management at that time. In other areas in the United States, they're still making honey for a long period of time. And there's no easy miticide to put in the hive to, can, to uh, suppress varroa buildup during that period of time. What I have discovered based upon some research by the Magi group out of Argentina is if you take oxalic acid and dissolve it into glycerin and put it on a cellulose matrix, like a, a sponge or, or, or something like that, put it in the hive, it gives an extended release of oxalic acid and it does not contaminate the honey. It doesn't have adverse effects on the bees. And if you put you put it on, so you should be able to put it on during the honey flow if we can get registered by by the EPA to do that. I've, so I've been I've got an experimental use permit from the state of California every year to run experiments to collect hard data on this. I've been publishing that. I just sent off an update from this year. Um, and we'll see. So I've quantified, I've quantified the dose. I've quantified what works, how to make it. We've uh, worked with USDA on this. So we tested the honey to make sure it doesn't get into, into the honey. And um, uh, it doesn't have adverse effects on the bees during the summer. And I've just yesterday collected the data of a winter trial to put it in there. And it didn't show any adverse effects on the bees over, over winter. So this 
is going to be a major game changer. And I'll tell you right now, the commercial beekeepers are following this very closely and uh, sending me donations to support this, this research. The question is getting it registered. And right now, the USDA, who was a registrant for oxalic acid um, for um, use in beehives, decided to give that up. They are now uh, working with an other registrant um, to take over. The question is whether that registrant is going to uh, take the money to pursue this um, um, uh, additional application method to make it legal to use. Um, I had a meeting with EPA Ops, the pesticide programs, last week and asked them, would they be willing to consider New Zealand's model? New Zealand said, hey, we just, we're going to give an own use exemption and the beekeepers free to use oxalic acid in their hives any way they want. And that would have made it totally legal. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way with the EPA. They don't make laws, so they can't make that law. So I have a few beekeepers I'm working with now. We're going to see if we can find a legislator to see if they can push that law through, which would solve the problem incredibly. It would just revolutionize beekeeping. In lieu of that, we're thinking about setting up a, a nonprofit just to register, register it ourselves if the other registry chooses not to do that. And, and um, so that we supply both oxalic acid at a reasonable price to beekeepers. And the thing is, they can buy it. Any, anybody can buy oxalic acid right now very cheaply and make their own product and put it in their beehives. But you're breaking the law. Right. If we register it and then they buy it from a registered uh, seller, and what we would do is just do it on a nonprofit basis, um, then, then they would not be breaking the law. So we'd make all these commercial guys who are right now scoff laws, forcing all the bee inspectors to turn a blind eye into what they're doing, they could be legal. And that's, that's, that's the short answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 the quick next question then, of course, is <laughs> if I want to see this happen, if I want to see a legal oxalic acid uh, application technique developed and made legal, uh, and I want to support that, how, where do I send my money? God, I, I wish I had an easy answer because right now we, I don't know why, but the USDA is working in kind of semi-secrecy about who the new registrant is. So we're not mm -hmm. even a lot, we don't know who it is or we can't even approach them to add, we have an idea. We're, we're trying to go around channels to ask them, are they going to pursue this registration or not? Because um, I've already got the wording for it. It'd be very simple to do. Uh, we we'll also uh, talked to IR4, which, will, uh, 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 which is university research, which I've already spoken to them. They will help us to do it. And we talk, I talked to the Office of the Pesticide Programs, and they said, it's not going to cost that much money. So I've got three other beekeepers right now who all are, uh, maybe we're going to pull our money and try to do this. But I can't guarantee just exactly what's going to happen. So... Um, you know, I don't like I don't self promote at all. I, I can say, yeah, just send me money and we'll put it towards that, which would which would likely happen. But I'm I'm not. We're still right in the middle of this conversation uh, right now, figuring out just what we're going to do. If anybody has a connection with a legislator who might be willing to put forward a law for the United States saying, hey, how about an own use exemption for beekeepers? Then the EPA would be happy to follow that if we come up with a law. So uh, anybody with the connections, do that. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, donations to scientific beekeeping, everything uh, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't go to me. It goes, it goes into research or something like that. But um, at this point, um, I'll put out a call. If we get to the point where we're actually in the process of registration and have a fixed amount of what we need, I will, I will notify the industry and say, hey, now you can send the money here. Well, I guess yeah. the people who who want to do this are going to follow this uh, by going to Scientific Beekeeping, your webpage, which has uh, uh, more than tons of information on it. It's just it's 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 a go to place certainly for any beekeeper. Right. And it's it's poorly organized right now. I keep trying to find time to organize it properly and better search functions. So right now, it's essentially it's a list of all the articles I published since 2006 in in order by by date there is a search function for word or phrase at the top so you can look in there 
Uh, but mainly, if you just look at the articles by publication date, look at the titles. That'll give you a good idea. Okay. The, and the most re- always the, go from the most recent ones. I'm, I'm continually updating. Now, I publish mainly in the American Bee Journal, but um, uh, I update my articles. So I go to the website because I can then go and keep updating. So I'm updating them all the time. With the, so if I've written something in the past and I find out it needs to be corrected or added to, I'm always updating those. I hope someday to be putting them all into a book, putting it all together. But um, I already I already work 14 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm having trouble finding extra seconds <laughs> to take on any more product pro- projects. I can I can believe that. I I, I we're we're we've covered the the almond situation and 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 you've brought brought me up to date like today on your, your uh, breeding program. Um, uh, we've got we're running we're running the clock here, but what have we missed that you want to get out? What message? Well, okay. How about on drill management? The the message is, um, I ha- I have a mite model out there called Randy's Varroa model. You can Google it. You can bring it right up. Um, um, and um, if you if you have Excel on your computer, it works best. Um, and it allows you to uh, plan a management strategy for Varroa. Now, a couple of years ago, I put out the word message: some people, beekeepers, don't have Excel uh, uh, available. How about an online model? And a beekeeper named Trish Harness stepped up to the plate. She was in a class doing programming. She said, "Okay, we're going to make it my project." And she's worked on this for two years, and she just now has an online. Uh, a model up, and uh, if you go to the website, uh, Chickabuzz, C H I C K A B Z Z, like a girl, Chickabuzz.com, and uh, right on the w- front web page, on to the left, it says Randy's Bro model, and that it will work on your cell phone. Um, it, it's a, it's an app that you can, and it's free. Um, by all means, send Trish some money because she spent two years working on this out of the goodness of her heart to make this out there. It's a simplified version of the Excel model. But what you can do then is you can adapt it. The, the model can go as deep as you want to go into varroa buildup and varroa management. And you can adapt it for any place you live on the planet Earth to what your seasons are, um, what your management is. And then you can uh, you have an option at, in 15-day intervals putting in entering any mite treatment the percentage of mite uh, reduction from that treatment and it tells you how to do that and then you can it plots out and it shows you what how that will affect the varroa treatment and what your infestate are your your varroa um, population in the hive and what your infestation rate will do and it's very easy then to make a plan a custom plan for your own management looking at your windows of opportunity when you have a break when you're not going to have honey supers on what your timing is and I'll tell you, the short version is, for most any place you live, you want to control varroa very early in the spring, as early in the spring as possible. You want to get that level down to close to zero, especially before you put your honey supers on. And then you generally will want to get mites back down to close to zero in the middle of August, depending on if, you have, if you're in an area with, with a winter, so that your um, uh, your Last rounds of brood, which are going to become your winter bees, are not exposed to virus, to the deforming virus, because that's what causes much of the winter collapses these days. But you have to get your mite level down in the by by the middle of September, so that the virus infestation rate in the colony is is low enough that the last rounds of brood can be reared. We have bees that are not infected by the uh, virus. Uh, emerging, and those can be, will be your healthy winter bees to take your colony through the winter. Well, Jeff, you're going to have that, uh, yeah. that web page uh, link on on our web page so that people can go and take a look. And absolutely, it's, it's early spring now, so now is when people are going to need to be uh, thinking about getting started on this. I'm looking at I'm looking at 18 degrees and snow today, so I'm I've got a little <laughs> bit of a window here yet, but. Um, not much, not much. Springtime to the bees is not about date. Right. It's about temperature and pollen availability. So springtime is when they first are looking at starting to ramp up brood ring, you know, nip, nip it in the bud right then when they're, we're, we're in their first rounds, get varroa down at that time. So we're going to have to see where these, this extended release oxalic acid will fit into this rotation strategy. 
one of the mistakes that beekeepers make is the first thing any beekeeper asks me is, oh, you got this great new treatment? Can I just leave it in the hive all year long? <laughs> <laughs> I hear that over and over again. Uh, yep, there's. I, I think, Jeff, that's the, the piece of advice that we've been looking for is get it started as early in the spring as you can and monitor it to make sure that it's working. And um, I'll add this because I always need it. Good luck. I hope it works. And Randy, thank you for all of this. It's been amazing. You bet. Uh, and, and people tune into his webpage, look for his re most recent articles. If you don't get ABJ, you can, you can uh, find them on the webpage and keep up with what he's doing, how the breeding program's going, and how uh, uh, the scheduling is going. Randy, thank you. You bet. Yeah, Randy, it's been a, a great pleasure having you on the show. Um, I feel like we've barely touched the surface, so look forward to having you back at a, at a future <laughs> you, date. You got you nailed it right there. <laughs> this is this is a skim of yeah, the. Yeah, we just kind of uh, introduce you. So thanks so yes. much for taking your time out of your busy day, especially this time of year, to joining us on Beekeeping Today podcast. Thanks a lot. Good luck with the almonds, Thank you. and good luck everybody with your bees. Well, I forgot to strap in on that interview with Randy. Man, he goes a mile a minute, but there's so much information that he gave us. Yeah, that's uh, typical Randy, and and uh, if you know that going in, um, you're ready for it. But if you if you haven't heard him before, you haven't heard him in a long time. Um, it's a lot of information. It's it's uh, coming it's uh, coming at you bullet speed, and and you better be paying attention. Uh, the, the 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 nice thing about this Jeff is that there'll be a transcript of it. Yes, um, everybody. Uh, feel free to uh, look at transcripts. If you never looked at our transcripts, I'm sure you'll want to look at them uh, for this episode because Randy was really, really nice and shared a lot of uh, valuable information um, with us. Um, uh, check it out. Yep. Um, up to date. Uh, it sounds promising. And keep your fingers crossed that it works. Yeah. I'd really like to get something on, get on top of those Varroa. All right. Well, before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us even quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We want to thank Strong Microbials for the support of the podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for joining us as a supporter. Check out all the great beekeeping supplies this spring at www.betterbee.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? Just one thing, like I always say, Jeff, if you think, uh, if uh, our listeners think that the show is good and worth listening to, share it with a friend who didn't get to listen to it because there's a lot of good information and uh, maybe your bees will be alive next spring. Thanks a lot, Kim. Thanks, everybody. 